Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. I am with a very special guest and somebody that does the work to not only help others, but she helps the most vulnerable type of people in this world and those that have been human trafficked and to prevent that. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Alana Stott. Hey, girl. Hey, how are you? I'm so good right now. I learned about you very quickly through your husband, through Dean. And Dean is um, one of those people that takes a special person to be married to. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I did Tell hear, me. I heard recently, I think it was on Jocko's pod, one of his old podcasts where I heard that 95% of um, tier one special forces get divorced. So I think I'm, I'm in the 5% so far. So. That's right. I, I heard that as well. And that to me feels like an astronomically high number. But knowing a lot of those guys that I do, it's, it's like the Ranger or Navy SEAL um, starter pack. You get yeah. like a DUI, you <laughs> get a divorce, <laughs> and yeah. you get something else going on. Yeah. So it's a oh, charge or something maybe. So, yeah. yeah, you got to get one of them. It's like <laughs> one of the three or you're not really a, you know, a soft guy. And then, yeah. and then what, right? Um, yeah, he, I, we got talking about you actually during his podcast and I was very excited because it was a... It was something I didn't uh, expect. Um, I was always hoping that when I talk to people, if their spouse is, you know, around them often enough, it takes a special type of person. And so I was hoping when he started talking about you, that you would be exactly what you are. And, and that is such a badass. And so you lived up to the hype and I'm so excited to be able to chat with you today um, and for our listeners to learn a lot more about what you do, because I believe what you do is what is so necessary, but also so underlooked and overlooked and not in the media. It's not brought up enough. It's not discussed enough. And maybe I'm wrong here and maybe I'm speaking out of turn. So correct me, but I feel like if this was an ongoing conversation in the public, the awareness factor, the idea, the signs and things to look for um, with victims and, and those that, that, you know, unfortunately get trafficked, we might be able to prevent, um, future trafficking victims from happening. So please tell us a little bit more about what you do in that world. Yeah. So, I mean, trafficking was something that I became a, probably quite early on, um, as a, a I wasn't a victim of trafficking, but I was a victim of sexual assault. And I learned about the process of how a woman has to deal with that through the court system and through, um, and it was, you know, we were talking over 20 years ago now, and it was still in that very much victim blaming culture. And I learned about, um, you know, the power of manipulation control. And that was quickly how I started to learn about trafficking and uh, the, you know, there's a lot of kind of Hollywood movies about it and you do see these these different things, but it's it's quite far from what, what the truth of it is. And, the, you know, the first part would probably be that we see most often would be the grooming side of it, where a victim, the, the hardest part about trafficking is the victim doesn't know she's a victim sometimes. That's, that's the most difficult bit to deal with. And then you're trying to teach law enforcement about what a victim is and how you should be dealing, you know, especially when we've got so much countries still having prostitution being illegal it's it's you're treating the victim as the criminal and then the criminals are often getting away with the the actual crime you know trying to trying to get somebody on a, a human trafficking charge is unbelievably hard and that was why we had a lot of drug dealers moving into human trafficking because if you're caught with you know five kilos of heroin you're pretty much going to go to jail but right. if you're caught with a girl in the car there's a lot you can explain there and she's probably worth the same amount to, to a, a trafficker as you know five kilos of heroin so um they, they quickly moved realizing they could make a lot more money out of uh, trafficking girls and kids than they could out of uh, out of drugs so it, it slowly became the biggest industry in the world at 150 billion dollars a year so it's a uh, a huge a huge beast to kind of deal with and um especially the, the worst part is 
people are still so unaware of it and aware unaware that it happens unaware that it's still going on if you speak to people about slavery they'll say you know back in the day you know slaves in the cotton fields or you know back in Egyptian times whatever they may think of when they think of slavery they don't think that the girl doing your nails at the salon or um you know whatever it might be they 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 totally miss overlook it now I think and whether it's an awareness thing, um, an education thing, a knowledge thing, all those things need to come in to fight something that's $150 billion a year. Well, what's interesting when you bring up um, that number, and I'm sorry for my face for sounding or looking as for my listeners, um, when you said $150 billion a year, I'm not going to lie to you, that that made my stomach quite sick. Um, You're a mother, I'm a mother. The idea that that is going on at the rate it is, that means that these children, I, I, children are being taken um, and abused and <clears throat> uh, trafficked so frequently that 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 would have to be the numbers would have to. The, it's just I'm lost for words right now with that total because. I, I, I obviously, the reason I wanted to speak with you is to educate not only myself, but my listeners, but $150 billion a year. Yeah. So if you think about it in numbers, the, the budget of the U.S. Marine Corps is $46 billion a year. So Whoa. we're talking about three times yeah. the size of the U.S. Marine Corps is what we're having to fight. And um, it's... Yeah, as you said, children, children are one, so there's 46 million slaves in the world estimated and one in four is children. And in the US, every 40 seconds, a child goes missing. So a significant amount of them are trafficked as well. So it's, you know, it is the vulnerable children. There is, there is all, it's from all walks of life. That's one thing that we, we have to get across is that it can happen to anybody. We've seen it happen to the richest of families, to the poorest of families, to the whitest of families to, you know, every, every single, it can happen to everybody. I'm just, wow. Um, when you, and I don't want to pry, so let me know when to stop. You said that you were a victim um, of sexual assault and that to me, first off, I'm very sorry to hear that. I know obviously the type of woman you are now, you have worked through those scars never leave a person, but you have learned the ins and outs and what it's truly like to go through the system. I wonder, there's so much to unpack here. So just bear with me. And something like that, I'm going to start with that. If you don't mind, let's make that the start point because I want to make it a very linear line for people to educate themselves. When somebody goes through an assault like that, it's not always, like you said, a trafficking thing, or it's not always what you thought was a trafficking thing or a type of assault. It's a grooming thing. It's you're being brought around people. You're being, you're being told and taught certain things. When that happened to you, how old were you? Um, 17. So you were a minor. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, class as a minor here wasn't in the UK. So um I yeah if it had been so the 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 two guys were obviously a lot older um and if it had been here it would have been a simple clean cut case but um it it wasn't so much so the it was I I guess the the way that we kind of look at it now is that I you know I was 15 when my mum passed away and almost you immediately become a target because as a young girl, if you don't have that that mother figure, that father figure, that love that you need, you see it in foster kids, you see it in, in various things that you do navigate towards people who you think you can get affection from or you can get love right. from. And these these guys are, are a lot of them are predators and they're looking for that kind of vulnerability. Um, so whether it is sexual assault, grooming, trafficking, it's all got the same kind of feel to it, I guess, if, if you look yes. at the, if the people that are committing the crimes and the, and the victims of the crime they, they're very right. similar um so the, the I think the difficult thing with with my case was um I knew them and it was it was a drug um incident and um I actually didn't have any evidence to give I guess because I was completely out cold I didn't know what had actually happened right. and it, it was the um perpetrators who who told the police what happened so they almost confessed without actually knowing they were confessing um 
but then said it was consensual so it was it was uh, the police that then obviously took you know i think on the on the fr- the actual conversation that I had with the police was um the policeman said did you do this the first guy said yeah but it's okay because she's my girlfriend and the second guy said yeah but it's okay because he said it was okay and that was the the conversation that happened and then that was um i lived in a, a small town that thrived on tourism so the backlash came to me because I was bringing shame to this village almost and and I think that you know that what I always say about sexual assault is the actual for however long five minutes to now whatever it takes of the sexual assault is, is never the damaging part of course it's damaging but it's the aftermath it's the fallout it's the way you're treated the way you feel the way you behave everything mm-hmm. that comes with it is the damage the damage that keeps happening um, I mean, when it happened to me, I had uh, a male medical examiner. And Whoa! Was, yeah, so it was, he was, he'd been woke up in the middle of the night to come out. And it was a case of stand on that sheet, take your clothes off, you know, open, like, it was horrible. And it you said- You were traumatized again and yeah, again. And again. And it happens to, you know, when trafficking victims are rescued, there's often like a big bust, you know, a group of SWAT guys or whatever will go in grab these girls, pull them out, arrest them, put them into a cell. You know, again, it's just re-traumatizing over and over again. And anybody who's ever suffered with PTSD will know that those things just keep those triggers going and just making them worse and worse. So there's 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 a lot of education needed in that side of things in the law enforcement side as well. And and unfortunately it's it's all charities that are doing it. It's it's, it's really the governments that are actually working towards it. It's the charities that are having to go in and help law enforcement and court systems and victim support and what's the age of consent and what makes you not what age is a, a considered a minor over in Europe uh, in in UK it's 16 so 16 is the, the the legal um consent age which it still is at the minute yeah Ooh. um and I mean well one of the guys was 37 for me and oh and he um yeah, so it was, you know, it was pretty obvious what was happening. But I think what what happened with me was that, you know, the, the town were obviously very angry that I'd, I'd, I'd come forward, but it was that nine other women came forward. And one by one, they all dropped out because um, they were intimidated, they were threatened, just, you know, just like I was. But to me, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these people that is super protective of other people, but not always as much of myself. So when I seen these other girls, I was like, no, I need to do something for them to, to right. stop that, that happening. Um, but yeah, then the court system was very much, you've got to prove that, that this happened, which is very difficult when you can't remember anything that actually happened. So the uh, burden of proof was on you. It wasn't on those to prove yeah. that they, d- it, it should be reversed. Is it, yeah. should it not? It, it has now. They've changed it now with the whole, um, the, the system did change that they have to, to prove that there was consent given, but it took a long time. Um, and then still with human trafficking, the, the numbers are just so unbelievably low of convictions because that burden of proof is, is really difficult um, to get through. And, I, and I, we, we often compare it just now with domestic violence, that there was a time that trying to prove domestic violence or get domestic violence to, to even go to court or go to the police was, was, was unbelievably hard because it was, you know, it was classed as a, you know, personal thing and it was, you know, domestic disturbance, whatever it might be that, um, whereas now I think we, our laws are, are changing, you know, here and in the UK that that we're not accepting domestic violence anymore, um, and that's where I'd like to get traffic into is that it's actually just as open as what domestic violence is um, that we can say, you know, this is what trafficking is and this is not acceptable. And that's a oh my god, that's an admirable goal. That's a goal and a half. That's what you call um, something that I believe is still attainable, but it is it is a monumentous climb it's like climbing Everest with no air that feels almost impossible but yet for some reason you kind of give me a little hope and and uh, here's why because if somebody can survive and then not only survive but then thrive and then take that fight to the people that shows a specific type of person and that takes a specific type of person and door kicking mentality to be able to do that when you 
had all of that happen and you were having who advocate for you? Was it, uh, did you have to go and get your own people? Did the police help to back it up? I'm not understanding how the court could look at you, see your age, see the age of these offenders and put the burden of proof on you. I'm, I'm just not understanding. It was, I mean, you, you were given the, so we've got the CPS, which I guess is like your district attorney um, yeah. and the CPS give you a lawyer who I probably met once or twice. It wasn't, you had, there was a victim support service, but that again, it was a non-profit mm -hmm. that you would go to and they kept you in your room. Um, you know, when I was in court, I was literally face to face with, with the guys. I mean, actually one pleaded guilty just before we entered court. So he didn't come into the room, but the other one went through um, and their barrister was actually, their, their solicitor was a, a female. So, and that, and that always, you know, it really stuck with me that it was just like, come on, sisterhood, you know, like she, she, she knew the story. She knew the, she knew everything that had gone on yet. She still kind of went at me in the, in the courtroom. Um, and then it is her job and I do get that, but it was always something that stuck with me that, yeah. yeah, that's that's you know, you 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 how you felt right about that. You felt it just as much as any other woman would feel about that. I always I always um you know, in TV and they portray these these women to, you know, defense attorneys and 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 all of these types of things, but there's got to be a line drawn in the sand here where we go, okay, you are just as vulnerable as me. That I was just in this situation. I just happened to be that person in that time. That could have easily happened to you. And so to see somebody going at you like that, I'm I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Um, I'm not glad it happened to you, but what I am glad for is that you were exposed to this in order to help prevent this from happening. And I think that's like you said you're protective when when somebody has this happen and it rolls through the court system and things like that what is the off most often if you could give me a ballpark of what would happen what's the legality for them how long are they in jail what's the ramifications for somebody that does these types of things I always remember there was a, a guy called it was Jeffrey Archer, he was a politician who'd, who'd lied on stand for, you know, it was perjury he committed for a fraud case. And he went to jail at the same time for nine years. My um, perpetrators got nine months and 12 months. That was there. Uh, and all, I remember always thinking to myself, you know, to this day, it still never left me. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously stronger I you know I fight to help other people I've used it for good but I don't think any woman who's or man who's ever experienced it it won't go away um and they get you know a year in jail and but somebody who lies on the stand gets nine years it just it always feels like how, how you know this this type of crime doesn't seem as serious as maybe committing tax fraud or something or or these other the other right. things. I'm, I'm super confused, but it's all about when you come back to it and you think about the money, the power, the, it, it goes back to that same right. story. You know, it's it's all about that thing. So, um, you know, women are constantly having to fight just for these. You know, there's there's cases happening at the minute where women are getting murdered on the streets of London and things, and we're being told, you know, stay in the house at night, don't wear this clothes, don't walk out, out on your own. And it's just like, when are we going to start saying, just don't rape people, <laughs> just don't. Why is that so hard? Yeah. But that, no, I've, I've read about that. I was, I had a, a gentleman on the podcast recently, Garrett Jones, and we were chatting. Um, him and I just went off like hours. <laughs> I feel like him and I are the same person, except I my my mullet's cooler. So I'll get, you know, whatever. Um, but we were chatting about that, and because I asked him, he had posted a few things about the the London. There was a a rape in London, and it was it was quite popularized, and it was brought up in the media, and it came made it its way all the way over here. And he was posting things saying, "Why are we telling women that they have to stay in their house? Why yeah. are we telling women that they have to be on a, a type of lockdown or don't dress a certain way? Just don't rape people." And yeah. the comments he was getting was was just mind boggling to me because it, that doesn't feel to me like that should be even be a discussion. Mm -hmm. Don't rape people. Why is that so hard for individuals? I think that. The one thing I've got since moving over here, um, we, we're learning about the different things that people have to do. Like, for example, if 
you're an African-American mom, dad, and you've got a little boy, at some point you're going to have that talk about, you know, if you're getting right. pulled over by the police, the, the lights, everything else. Similarly, every woman with a daughter, every mom with a daughter, is going to have that talk with the girl about how to stay safe, about how not to drink. We're always going to do that. We, we have that talk with our little ones, but you don't hear very often about that talk with a young boy to say, look, respect women, treat women properly. If a woman's drunk, you don't touch her. If a woman says no, you stop. You know, these kind of conversations should be happening at that age. And I know with, like, I've got two brothers and with what happened to me, they're probably over the top about it. I mean, I've seen my brother get, my older brother get hit on by the most beautiful woman in the club, but she's had a few drinks and he'll say, you know, give me your number. I'll speak to you tomorrow. If you still want to meet right. up, that's great. And he's it's just super respectful because he's seen how how life was for me um and very often here and and at home you see kids that are just not getting that that talk and that education and that, that life skills to be able to say you know um that's not acceptable and you see social media and people posting things and doing things that they, they shouldn't be doing and I think when there's that that group mentality saying as you say, with with Jez, there's there was comments on his post saying, but you know, not all men are like that. No, That's great, but there is men like that, and you could possibly know them. And we need you all to be like, no, that's not acceptable because the more that they think it's acceptable, because there's people saying, um, you know, not all men rape. That's that's super, but we need you guys to be the ones who are saying to them, yeah. you know, we don't want to be your friend if you think that's okay. If we think because there is a lot like. Um, well, that, hap that happens though. You see that over in the, and I say the United States. And the reason I use the United States as the example is because I <clears throat> don't know much about the universities in my own country, truthfully, but I do know from hearing about cases in the United States university, that group mentality where they're at a big party and everyone's drunk. And then next thing you know, the girl has been like gang raped by all these, t these people. And people think it's acceptable because they were the star athlete. They were protected. They've got, Oh no, my buddy said this. And this whole group of people is just going to back up what they say. And that's like what happened with your funders is they, one's just going to back up the other and then they're going to get Get away with it and it happens on a daily basis yeah and I think that, that that's that that almost justification mindset when when I, you know you hear about the judges letting them off because maybe they've got a bright future ahead of them or right. something yeah and you think well you're giving him that justification so the next time he does it it's on you because you've told him it's okay so when he goes out next time and it happens again, which it will, let's like if you're if you've done it once and you've got away with it, you're you're going to give it another go. Um, and again, add into that power and control. They've just almost been given the tick to to go ahead and have more power and control. Whereas the the you know the the whole the slut shaming the, that kind of behavior around women. Well, you know she was super drunk or she was you know we've seen that she was like dancing provocatively or you know to me it's and I, I would say it to everybody that consent can be given and taken away at any point and even if it's in the middle of the act if they say stop it stop and if you carry on you're wrong and yeah it might not be the greatest thing but it's her body and she can do what she wants when she wants with it um or his body it happens to men as well you know well that's something um I'm glad that you bring up because I think a lot of people don't realize that it can happen to men and, and, and honestly, that's a, that's a very, and, and that may be a naive statement, but I, from what I see, from what I hear, if I were to say so-and-so got raped and it was a man, the first reaction I get is that's not possible. That's not humanly possible. <laughs> not humanly possible. Are you kidding me? A man can be raped just as a woman could be raped. And anybody yeah. says otherwise doesn't understand the physiological responses that a body can give. I, 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 I refer to a statement made, um, I believe it was during an art exhibit for Shia LaBeouf, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was some news article that came out saying that he got raped during um, an installation. He was tied to a chair and a woman came up and raped him. And, and people like, well, that, that can't happen. That's not possible. A guy can't just, that's not true at all. Yeah. I think we watched um, a film, me and Dean watched it recently. It was... Um... 40 Days and 40 Nights, the Josh Hartnett film. Yes. 
And at the end of the film, the girl comes in and, you know, let's just say it, she rapes him. But it's made, in the film, it's made a joke of it. It's made, like, you know, he he, he broke his um, celibacy by her coming in and doing that. And me and Dean both watched it and went, that that was rape. That was, that was actually, but it's almost in the film, it is not even acknowledged in the slightest bit that that could possibly be rape. Because as you say, he, if he gets an erection, it can't, can't be rape. But it's it's not about that. It's not about the, the physical. It's about the consent. Was consent given at that point? No. You know, and I, and I said, it, I can't actually believe it was only 20 years old, that film, but it's still completely, it isn't even mentioned, talked about anything that, that in that film there was a rape scene. Um, I'd be interested to see um when you start making enough noise, which I think is coming very quickly, I don't, I don't foresee it taking very long. I'd like to see that rectified. I'd like to see those conversations happen where it's not just about a woman, it's about a man. And I think it's because we're all equal. Like you say, when you, it's about consent, it has nothing to do with anything but consent. And if somebody is not giving that consent or is taking it away, it's, it is just not okay in period. And I know there are, uh, it, now in our, I want to say in our day and age. So I'm, you know, in the net, in the last like five years, I would say you're starting to see series and film come out where they're starting to address this on a bigger level. And I know there was one that came out. Um, I think it was 13 reasons why 13 reasons. Why does that make sense? It was uh, on Netflix and it was about a girl who committed suicide okay. and yeah, and it was a it blew up about this, you know, g giving an idea. They were saying this is perpetuating ideas for suicidal attempts and and a call for help. It's like, well, no, she was raped mm -hmm. by a high school teammate. No one believed her. This is yeah. where it started. No one gave her the benefit of the doubt because it was a varsity football star that raped her and no one was going to believe her over that. That drove her to suicide. And then they took this whole series and they made it about well, this is idolizing suicide. This is idolizing ideas of all of that. It's like, you're, you're missing the whole component as to why this girl was in such distress where she felt like this was her only option. And the reason I bring that up is because there is, in my mind, there is two ways to look at it. And if you're not looking at the reason why it happened, you're never going to fix the, the end result. You're never going to be able to to rectify it or correct it or prevent it from happening again. Yeah, and I think there were you know when you look at that that one in particular, the, the focus was to try and prove that this guy didn't do it or to say that he didn't do it. You know, I, I can imagine if it was ever in my household, um, that conversation wouldn't be around trying to prove it. what what happened, how did it happen, how did it go? Because that tells me that none of that conversation happened before. But I mm -hmm. I actually remember watching that with Dean, and I and I said that the one saving grace that I've got from from my experience was that there was no social media at the time because I couldn't imagine. Um, I mean, I received so much abuse and so much threats and just complete and I remember at one point just sitting there thinking I just wanted to end it all you know I never I never got to that stage and luckily I never done it but I remember just that feeling of that overwhelmingness if there'd been social media as well I can't imagine what it would have been like if you were just getting attacked and attacked and attacked um for something that, that's happened to you and yet don't get me wrong there are people that make false allegations and I, I know that that exists but it really is minority of of the of the the amount of victims that actually come forward is so so low um in comparison to what actually goes on and um I've just lost my train of thought. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, but when, when I, I'm glad you brought up the social media point. I think that's incredibly um important to touch on, especially because social media not only will it, in my opinion, drive somebody who's just been assaulted to have to take on a whole new subset of people making comments and posting photos and and making them feel some kind of way but i also feel like social media has to be a big component of trafficking and the ability to find people and the ability to take people and am i wrong on this it, i mean it's got definitely yeah pros and cons um they 
old days of no social media, we used to have very distinctive like red light districts. We had, um, you know, areas that you would see people in the streets you could see. But again, the majority are treated as prostitutes and pimps. That's the kind of the, the kind of old way of saying it, prostitutes and pimps. Trafficking can happen from, you know, you meet a guy, you fall in love, he's super sweet, super nice, gives you everything you want, and then all of a sudden there's a bill to pay or there's a friend that's due something or will you just help me out with this guy? You know, it becomes one, it becomes two, it becomes ten. Um, I mean, we've dealt with everything from, um, I mean, every story of existence, but a, a, a friend of mine who was trafficked was, you know, 30 to 40 times a day with oh men. Um, now, I, to be honest, I'm one of those people that if, if you want to sell your body, that is your choice. It's, if it's your body and you want to sell it, I'm one of those people that, that agrees that, that you shouldn't be arrested for prostitution it's it's your your body your choice but um if somebody else is, is taking that choice and making the money and doing everything else and you're forced to do something 30 40 times a day um while somebody else is profiting huge amounts of money off it that's not okay um and then you've got the other side of the scale where you know i, I remember the first time i really got into trafficking was 2010 when the haiti disaster hit and I had a friend of mine who'd got in touch and she said she was going to do, because when a disaster hits, that's when the traffickers will move in because orphans, you know, kids will be orphaned, they'll be very vulnerable, they'll move in and pick them up. Um, so there was a makeshift orphanage set up in Haiti for under five-year-olds, all of which were going to be getting trafficked because there is that um, dark underground side that, that like young young children, babies. Um, oh, God. And, yeah, I mean, one of the organizations I was dealing with recently, they had an 18 month old in trafficking. Oh, for Christ's sake. Oh, yeah, man. you can't you can't go into that too much. But it's it's so so when I went to to this woman, I said, well, what do you need? And she says, well, I'm trying to get there, but there's a price tag on my head. They, you know, they're going to kill me if I go and try and help. Could you get me some protection? Um, You're like, the- I do that. That yeah. is my life. Hold on. Let me call my husband. Yeah. At that time, I hadn't done it. And that's when I said to Dean, well, who can we get? And everybody that we spoke to, the price was huge to, to go in and help these people. And I was like, we should be doing this for free. This should be something that we're offering for free. And that was why I trained as a bodyguard. Because I was like, this has to be done. by We have right. to be able to do this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's industry upon industry. You're kind of dealing with people that are making money from it, people that are doing kidnap and rescue, people that are doing the trafficking. It's just all business. While well, this one little victim is the one who's who's suffering all the way, all the way along. And yet, and then you've got the aftermath of it all, which is the the PTSD, the trauma, um, the the re-traumatization they've got to go through, and then trying to get that to court is such a difficult task for police for court systems and for and for the victims so trafficking is such a, a huge trade because they get away with it is is the biggest thing why i would say why do they get away with it but it, there has to be people being paid off on some level here because there's no way you cross borders with large amounts of humans and people turn the other way you just don't yeah I think the involvement, I mean, we've seen everything from FBI, judges, um, the involvement's huge. There's, 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 I mean, it's $150 billion a year. So as much as what the drug trade would have people involved in the border crossings, it's the same, it's the same thing, but now we're dealing with, with people. Um, and it's from, you know, I, we, I mean, sexual slavery is my biggest passion to fight, but the forced labor, the domestic servitude, the, you know, even organ harvesting, there's everything that goes on. Um, and I think that the, the, the biggest thing that I want to start getting people to do is even if we started from the start and just started cutting their supply lines, you know, there's huge businesses that are using forced labor right. and making huge profits off it, you know, famous names that are, are making a lot of money from forced labor. If we Can stop buying... Animals? <laughs> um Nike was one um and they've they've been pulled up quite a bit lately so we'll, we'll say that we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they're starting to work on it there was a boohoo which was in the UK they got some serious ramifications but even in their UK staff they weren't paying properly so they 
the difficulties see is you've got the, the supply chain that can go all the way through to Bangladesh and then you're trying to work um on that yeah on that um and, 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 you know people are saying well at least they've got a job at least they're working yeah but 20 hours a day on a machine for no money while you sleep on the floor for the last four hours is not a life it's not it's not about a job that that's not a way to live um and yeah I think there's a humanization of it as well that we've we've got you know we we talk about the um I was speaking to somebody about things like the Holocaust and you know the Ku Klux Klan and, and the thing was these people that were committing the crimes they just didn't see these people as people and it's very similar right. with with trafficking, they don't see them as people, but then you'll have people that will say, well, you know, they're bad, we're good. I mean, I've heard people in the UK with migrant crossing over from, you know, the Mediterranean Sea and the boat capsizes and they all die in the sea. And, mm -hmm. and people in the UK will be like, well, that's great. That's one less boatload of immigrants coming over. And you're thinking those were people. That was a mum that just, you know, fought to save her daughter while she was drowning or, you know, to to make them to dehumanize people is what makes it easy for people to then do the trafficking because if we're not seeing a boatload of African kids as people then then they're 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 going to be so easy to you're to fighting a losing battle when yeah. it's a mentality thing you're already starting off on a terrible position if you're sitting there <clears throat> like you said dehumanizing these people and it I remember seeing some of that uh, when the Greek, when the whole Greece uh, right during Syria, when people were coming over on boats and droves and they were going to all these different countries and being turned away. And there's brand new babies on that boat. There are mothers on that boat. There are fathers on that boat. There are people that are fleeing some of the most horrific crimes in the world to save their kids. And yet they're being seen as these as these immigrants, these immigrants, these immigrants. I hate that so much. Uh, my family are immigrants. My everyone is an immigrant. I don't care what anybody oh, yeah, says. Exactly. Everybody in America is an immigrant. Everybody in Australia is an immigrant. You know, and you see them, and you think they're literally turning boats away for them to die. And they're saying, yeah. "Well, we don't want." Them. I mean, you know, in Britain, you will say they'll come over here, they'll get mansions, they'll get this. No, they they really, really won't. But what they won't do is be bombed every day or face um, gender-based violence or face trafficking or face, we, we can help them and we've got enough to help them. So um, it just, it blows my mind that people can't see people as people because they're not from the same place or they're not the same color or they're not the same religion or whatever it might be. You heard it back in the day when, you know, September 11th happened. Oh, we'll just go blow up Afghanistan. <laughs> oh, no. Doesn't work like that, buddy. <laughs> Doesn't do that. Oh, um, cool. But yeah, there, there is like, I mean, even we'll talk to Dean about it. And, uh, and I'll say that if we speak, uh, the easiest way to say to Dean is, are, are the Taliban um, bad people? And yes, they're bad people. They're all bad people. They're all horrible. They all, you know, they all, well, mm -hmm. no, maybe they're not. Because this is the way they've been brought up and they've been, t you know, there, there's, there's a system that's been put in place there, but yes, our people have all gone out there and been killed in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iran, and we will automatically think they're bad because of that. So we're, we're retaliating to them and then they're retaliating back. So the war's never ending. We're just constantly no. fighting back and forth because the government is telling us that that's what we should be leading. And that's the thing. We are allowing these... Um these other humans on another part of the world just because they happen to be born there and we're classifying them as less than. And it was the same when I went to Afghanistan and I talked to Dean about this. I never got to see, like Dean and I had this conversation when you're building relationships and he's going to these places, he's on the streets, he's in civvy clothes, he's dressed like an Afghani, he's meeting with these families, he's meeting with these kids. And the more and more and more and the longer I'm out and the more and more people I speak with that work with these uh I'd say borderline third world countries, because let's, let's make it um, as clear as it is. They don't have a lot. And if you go out into these villages, they have nothing. Most of them don't have running water. So how can you expect to educate or have these people understand anything? 
Mm -hmm. These people are vulnerable, whether they're born in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Iran, or they're born in the middle of China, like they're vulnerable. They're not, it's not just a Middle East issue. You've got people in, Bang like you said, Bangladesh, Thailand, like there yeah. are some of the most trafficked humans in the whole wide world. And it's because we allow it by, in my opinion, turning the other cheek because they're not from where we're from. It doesn't mean that we can't help another person. That person was still birthed by a mother. Like, I don't understand why but this concept is so difficult. To also learn, I mean, while Deans in Somalia or Yemen or Libya, or wherever he is, it, they're, without fail, I'll get a present home or I'll get um, a new friend that I'll make because he immediately makes friends with people and they become like family. We still speak to everybody that he's ever known in these countries because he does have that ability to make friends with, with anybody. But I think because he understands what what's important, you know, having a big house, having lots of stuff. Um, when you, I mean, I remember traveling through Guatemala and these kids were all just playing outside and they were just playing with like sticks and stones and going across the stream and not one iPad amongst them, not a phone amongst them. And they were laughing so loud. It was just mm -hmm. so much fun. And then sometimes you'll just walk around here and the, you know, the iPad's out, nobody's talking to each other, nobody's interacting with each other. And you're thinking, do you think that you're better than them? And they're looking at you going, you don't even talk to each other. <laughs> you're not yeah. even like, and, and these, I mean, I remember so many people say to me, the amount of times I've been to Mexico and traveled through Mexico that, Mexico is so dangerous and you should be careful with Mexico. And so it's the most beautiful, amazing country with the, with the most family focused, kind, mm -hmm. lovely people that I think I've ever come across. Um, of course, there's drug cartels. You know, somebody said to me um, the last time I was driving through Mexico, are you not scared? And I was like, well, I'm not planning on, you know, smuggling drugs. And I'm not <laughs> planning on shooting. So no, I'm not scared. So, you know, the chances of something happening to me probably pretty slim pretty rare going, going through LA however I'll probably be be scared um so yeah it's just it's just what we think they want like that we often think that they want to live like us but really a huge amount of the time they're thinking you guys are crazy <laughs> you yeah guys why would you want to live like that why would you not want to communicate with your family I know I when you brought up Mexico that actually just triggered a memory of mine and I'm kind of blown away that that just happened so um my mom and dad went down to Mexico for um, their anniversary when I was probably, I want to say six, okay? And my younger brother's two years younger than me. And we, we stayed with my Nana. And my mom came back and they went to Acapulco. So my mom's walking around. My mom's very much an outgoing, conversational. She just wants to help everyone. She has this heart of gold. And she showed me this picture and I'm now just realizing what the hell she meant because I'm literally just realizing it right now. She said, I went into this shop and there was this beautiful girl and she was probably 12 or 13 years old. And the gentleman asked me if I wanted to buy her. Yeah, I'm freaking out in my brain right now. My <laughs> brain is literally going a million miles. And I am... Uh, my mom said she almost said yes, so she could take her. Because if 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 they were being offered to two white Canadians, who else is she being offered to? And who is who's going to actually say no? Like it doesn't it 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 breaks my. I'm really struggling with this right now. I'm not even going to lie to you. Um, that was uh, twenty years ago. That was twenty years ago. And it's still happening. Yeah. Like people are still selling human beings on the street market and they're getting away with it. I don't know how you do this work. Yeah. It's, I mean, we've, we, because of the online, as you've just said, it's a lot more of it is online and the, the, the dark web and there's that, that is going on. A lot of it's just chained. But if you do go to, um, uh, Uganda there's a there's a market in Uganda where you can actually go and buy like you were going to go and buy fruit and veg or that you were going to go and buy you can still walk into this market on a Thursday afternoon and go and buy children from from it and I have people out in Uganda that try and fight this market but they just see it as it's income it's their income it's their trade and 
but, you know, they've got rich Saudis flying in. They've got all sorts coming in to buy these kids off, off of this street market. Um, you know, we've got one in again in Uganda, but it's a, it's a, a whole village, a whole village. And it's all classes and under eight village. And it's a dollar to, to go and do whatever it is you want to do in this village. And the guy who, who I work with over there, he's like, we just can't get not only the locals, but the parents to understand that this is not OK. This is not acceptable. And that because they just need the money, they need the money. And this is an easy way for them for them to get it. And um, until that kind of trickles down as well, that we, you know, the, the kind of person that, that pays that dollar needs to be strung up as far as I'm concerned. But when you've got a village and parents and everybody justifying it as well that's that's a huge amount of education and um I mean the trauma to that child is just you, you can't even imagine what what, what they're astronomical going to yeah that, that that child is most likely not going to make it past a certain age in my opinion um not only of suicide because I think that's what people forget and this may sound horrific to say and I hear myself saying it but suicide to me feels like a uh, would be a privilege for that child because yeah. they're most likely not going to get to, to end their own life. It's going to be a traumatic, very traumatic, painful existence. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there's people that are willing to do that goes down to the way that we educate our societies. And if these people are not being given or taught any other way, how can we expect them to ever improve? But yet we're willing to send billions of dollars to drop bombs on people and complain that we're, you know, we're harming um, civilians, but yet we're not willing to take those billions of dollars, not invade, but go actually educate and help other countries. The taxpayers, I could only imagine, would much rather see their dollars go towards helping rather than bombing individuals. Yeah, and it all comes down to money. It all comes down to how much money. And this is, I think Dean was telling me that there's now more trillionaires in the world now than ever before. And I just said, it just blows my mind. What What do you need that much money for? What do you need when there's people literally starving on the street? Why do we? Why do you need seven houses and millions and billions of dollars in the bank? When we've got a world where you know we've got ten million children in Yemen starving right now, like literally starving to death. Yet you've you've just went and bought your fifteenth Maserati or whatever it might be. Like, where does that compute? I mean, it just doesn't doesn't fit in my head, and I just don't get um, where it all comes from. But it does, and I think that I've been trying to work out for a long time ago I said Dean was like what do you want and I said I want to end slavery and he was like okay but it's been around for a very long time and I was like yeah but I really do think that we're starting to move into a world that we're not accepting stuff like we used to you know um right. what happened to to George Floyd it caused such a a huge movement and and while while that's great and while I think that's fantastic and we're pulling down statues of slave owners and stuff and it's like there's still slaves in the world today why don't you use yeah. all that anger and fight what, what's actually still happening um and it's not a black white thing it, it's a humanity thing we, we need to right. fight the actual people who are trafficking slaves today not <clears throat> so i want to ask you something then um do you think if we were to and and correct me if i'm wrong and i'm i know this information that i can't believe i'm oh god i can't even believe i'm gonna say this i know this information based off of a comedian set um is it true that australia has legalized prostitution oh i don't know i i, I heard something about that actually um um jim jeffries is it jim jeffries jeff Anyway, he is Australian guy. He's an Australian comedian. And it was the first time I'd heard uh, something like this. And I kind of caught, I was like taken back by it because I know um, there has been a fight for a long time for sex workers. Cause I'm not, I don't want to call them prostitutes because there's a difference between a sex worker who wants, like you said, to th that's her body, her choice, his body, his choice. If that's what he wants to do and he's comfortable with that and he's doing it on his own fruition and he's taking his own money, then all the power to you, you do what you want to do. And then I remember them saying that he took a friend of his or something to a brothel and it's legal in Australia. So I could be wrong on that. 
bit, I've got the world's worst of memory, so okay. I can do something recent. But I mean, I know things like in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Yes, trafficking still goes on, but it's 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 illegal. You know, it's right. illegal to travel. It's it's legal to to pro, um, sex work and prostitution, whatever it may be, is legal at an age at an age limit. Um, human trafficking is not. So it's it's a lot easier for them to say, well, actually, you know, you are selling that person; they don't want to be sold because right. it's more it's more obvious. Um, I mean, we've got there was there. I mean, there's a huge thing with the military as well that that trying to get them to understand when they're away on tours or, or whatever it might be that you know this is used as a weapon almost as well. So we you know yeah. trying to get them to stop that too. I mean, it's. The, the list could go on and on. I remember I left um, the UK and I'd gone to this doctor and he'd asked me what it was that I do. And I said, I worked in, in human trafficking. And he was like, what? Well, like, like slavery. And he said, oh, does that still exist? And this was a doctor. And I said to him, I was like, you of all people should know it does exist because you're looking for the signs. You're meant to be there in the front line looking for this. Um and that was that was worrying to me because they're going to be the first ones, the, the grooming, um, and and you see these. Um, I remember speaking to somebody about some of these girls that are, are, you know, you can imagine they want them to be like the movies where they're super sweet, innocent little girls that have just been abused, and they give a big hug when their rescuer comes in, and everybody's happy and everyone's safe. And it's like, no, they're angry, they're violent, they're aggressive. They'll they'll shout, they'll swear, they'll be the most like horrible little people you ever come across because inside them there's there's just nothing but pure rage um and and I think almost like when people see that they 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 treat them badly straight away you know this little angry little girl who's um you know got a mouth on her and she's tough and she's aggressive she's had to learn to be that way and that's where mm-hmm. I um you know, I think the law enforcement side of it is is still needing so much education on that, that, you know, these girls are, are not going to come to you and give you a big hug and say, thank you for rescuing me. They're, they're, they're going to no. fight. Um, they're going to fight. Yeah. And I was working, you know, the, the Orange Trafficking Human, ta- Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force, they say, they were, you know, they were, were still, they're learning here, they're, they are picking up on things, but the rest of the country has still got so much, so much to work on and here it's got so much to work on but it's, it's a world thing and I think that's one thing that, that I find that we need something because it's an international law that I think is needed and we don't have that international law you know slavery is illegal everywhere I think Mauritania was the last one to make it illegal but um, it was only a criminal offence in 2007 so it's taken till 2007 for the world to be illegal for slavery however it still goes on everywhere, 46 million slaves. So um, it's not being taken seriously enough. If To me, something that's completely illegal the world wide over has got 46 million slaves with $150 billion a year industry. The countries are not taking it seriously enough. Um, so a lot of work to be done. <laughs> there is a lot of work. I wanna ask you another question. Um, do you see if we were to start doing what Oregon has done, if we were start to decriminalize drugs, do you see that as a factor that would help trafficking or be more of a hindrance and cause more human trafficking to come through because drugs aren't the choice of um, way to make money at this point if they start to decriminalize all drugs? Um. <sighs> I guess criminalizing things, I mean, things like marijuana and stuff, it just, to me, it's kind of a, no, a no-brainer. I don't even know why it is a, a criminal offense anyway. But when prost, prostitution is the oldest industry in the world, and I, I don't think we're ever going to get away from people buying sex and people selling sex, but it's it's the industry that that we need to take down. So yes, drugs is a huge factor in in trafficking because again, the first thing they'll do is get the girl girls hooked on drugs. And um, if you made that illegal, uh, sorry, if you made that legal, um, I'm not sure. 
I mean, the human trafficking funds the drug trade. So I guess if you take one down, you're taking the other one down. Um, and everything else, the, the environmental impact, the, you know, we've got the fast fashion industry, you know, for every time you buy one of these cheap t-shirts or whatever it might be, they're, you're, you're funding. Um, I, I think you can work out, but I think the average American has got 30 to 40 slaves working for them on an every daily basis. When you think about the clothes you wear, the phones, you know, the, the products you use, things like that, that, that if we can if we can take that side of it down, I'm going off on the tangent now, but no, it's okay. Go ahead. It's, um, the things like if you cut if you cut that supply line off, if you say, well, actually, do you know what? Does your uh, is your supply chain slavery free? And if the answer is no, well, I'm not going to use your product. If we if we all done that, then we're taking away a huge amount of the industry. Yes, you've still got this, the the sexual slavery, but if you're cutting the profitability of this this business down, then less people are going to be coming into it. And if we were recognizing um, the signs of sex trafficking and abuse and you know porn sites that that are that are advertising these things, and um, again, totally, if you're doing it on your own back and you're doing it and you've signed consent forms and you've done all these things, but the things with like, I mean. Pornhub and a few other sites are starting to work a bit harder when your MasterCard have um, said no to Pornhub now. Um, but again, again on the tangent, but the damage that these things do to young girls, you know, from videos that are being uploaded without any consent forms needed signed and things, it's just right. unbelievable that that is even allowed, but it's internet. Well, that's the thing. The internet is that wild, wild west. And that's only the sides uh, that the general public see. Most people don't know how to access torrent and the black web tour and all of those things. And, and thank God for that, because if they did, could you imagine how much worse it could actually get? Um, when you're talking about these supply chains, I find it fascinating. You bring up fast fashion. So this is my world now. So I like this. I'm glad you're bringing this up. I'm super happy to hear that you're calling it out for what it is. You see these people building uh, clothing brands. You see these people, everybody can have a brand now, right? Everybody can do it, whether it's through, um, you know, made to print, whether it's from working with countries that have terrible laws and in, inhumanity. Um, I have multiple factories in China that I go and visit on a regular basis to make sure and approve and check and be there and check and see exactly who's working for me. Because at the end of the day, the number one thing you're you're looking at is, and and I'm talking on right now, I'm talking on an Apple product. Okay, well, let's talk about how what Apple really does. Apple has nets outside their buildings. You're born into it, and then you work for these factories. And and yeah, you're working for Apple, but don't don't tell me that any factory that's doing the right thing, that's treating their employees properly, that's not driving some type of slave labor, would need a net outside their building. Because yeah. that many people are jumping on a regular basis and they don't even want to, they're not even saying, okay, you're going to jump, let, you know, you're in that much pain, jump. No, no, no. We're going to catch you. We're going to pull you back in and we're going to continue to recycle your ass because we're not even going to allow you to end your own life. They've yeah. taken that right away. Yeah. And I think that, um, more if we had more people who were saying, actually, no, I want to go and check out that factory. I wanna, and it, you're right. I mean, we can't, we're all, we could all, um, and I, I remember when uh, when Harry and Meghan got a lot, a lot of grief for flying on a private jet and then talking about um, environmental issues and things. And it kind of got me because I was like, we can't, we're, we're trying to do all these things and yet I'm sitting on with an Apple computer in front of me. Some things like it's, you're trying to fight this big fight and you maybe have to take a private jet to go to the place. But I think the work that they do on the other side of it- Should kind of, offset it. Yeah, it kind of offsets that. Um, and yeah, we can all be a bit hip hypocritical. We, we were all, you know, do I own something that's maybe, yeah, probably, but if you're aware of it, um, you can start to, to, to make these dents and stop and it happen. Um, and, you know, it's, it is difficult because every, there's probably if, if if I could come across somebody who's never used anything in slavery or anything to do, then uh, you know it'd be. But uh, every person, that I've 
with who works in the industry is guilty at some point of driving a car or that you can't be a hundred percent but it's just if you could at least make those small steps to say and actually no I'm not going to you know there's a a store in the UK called Primark and everybody knows that these factories that are making this clothes are are slavery yet people still queue to go in here because it's you know five dollars five dollars for, for a dress or something and you think well rather than having 20 dresses in your cupboard save up that five dollars and buy a really nice hundred dollar item yeah nice quality that it's going to last that you can look at that you can wear i mean trying to get away from that instant gratification i think is, is yeah. something that would, would make a huge huge impact because you know we all do it we order from amazon i mean i couldn't believe when we moved here that i could order something that would be here in two hours i was like what why, why would i be desperate enough to need something in two hours that's it insane it breaks my brain a bit when you think yeah. that when you're like it can be it's in your house before like my my accountant makes jokes about it on a regular basis she'll be like i hit place the order she's like they call me it's in your house but it's <laughs> Buying. We have a right across the street from me, a very newly built Amazon distribution center. And I hate it. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's these corporations and, and you wonder why people feel it is a lost cause to go after these issues because you're going up against Apple in a two day span makes over a billion dollars. How is somebody supposed to fight that? I get, I mean, to me, it would be, I would love to sit down and speak to them and say, what what part of it do you need this this volume of wealth and power? Why is it that you right. need it? Because there's something in their head, whether it be Jeff Bezos, who's, they're thinking, I need this amount of power and I need this amount of money. And I don't think they've got the right, I think it's almost like you just need to give them a little bit of a mummy cuddle. There's something that, that is missing. It's missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just come here. Let me hold you close to the chest. You don't need a billion dollars. You can share your money, share yeah. your toys. It's okay if somebody <laughs> doesn't like it. It's going to be okay. But it comes down to how we we educate our kids. And before I get into that, I want to just backtrack a little bit with the Megan and Harry thing because I know you're quite close with them. And Dean and I had spoke about that before. But frankly, I'm sorry. For them to get backlash on going a private jet, tell me, explain to me for one second, how do you expect a part of the royal family that has been going on for generations and generations to go into a regular airport, safely, number one, mm -hmm. not be attacked, number two, and fly private, I mean, fly even first class and think that there's not going to be Number one, they get death threats on a regular basis. They get attack threats. They get, you know, the, the, their poor children in that whole situation where they were they lost their security for their kids. And then you give them grief for trying to keep their kids safe and themselves safe by flying on a private jet. Sorry, but suck it. I'll take a private jet all day long if I'm that type of person. You can't expect. There is levels to people. And I don't care what anyone says. That may sound horrifying and horrific to say, but there are levels. There are everyday people. My, I come from everyday people. I come from truck drivers. I come from hardworking. You know, I was never told no, but I come from hardworking families. I was in, you know, truck stops with my dad when my dad's like, you never let go of my hand. You never, ever let go of my hand because the reality is the trafficking is there. Then you get to the next level of people where there is now wants to take their children's based on ransoms. And then you get to Megan and Harry's level of people. And it's not that anyone's better than anybody, but they're in the public eye and you cannot expect a human being to not do everything they can to protect their children and themselves when there are people that are constantly trying to do them harm. There is yeah. no rhyme or reason for that. That's just, that's disgusting for anyone to comment otherwise. But then what we'll do, I mean, I think, you know, Harry fell in love with Megan and I, and I, I always say it's similar to me and Dean. We came, up, we came together because we got that love for helping people and we've got that kind of fight and that's what you know always brings us back to everything we do we always want to be helping 
helping someone. And when Harry met Megan, it was it was the same. He could he saw that in her, and he thought I can do something with her. They got together. They wanted to do it. The problem that was this was she was a woman. She was a woman with a life who had a voice, who had an opinion, and that wasn't acceptable for for the. Right the British press more than anything they, they needed that nod and dog the one who would do she was told that you know and she wasn't that person because the nod and dog isn't a way to change the world and she's 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 yeah. going to change so much um so then it was well you're not going to play our game we're going to you know show you what we can do when you don't when you don't play our game and it comes straight back to everything I've just said about trafficking I put it in the same category it's power it's greed it's power and you're not you, you're you know these people are here and the Megans the you know sex slaves whoever it might be we're here and you should be doing what we tell you to do and if you don't we'll, we'll destroy you and mm-hmm. that's effectively what they've done with her and then she's went well actually do you know what I'm not going to put up with this I'm going to go back somewhere where I feel safe, where I've got people that, and then, well, actually, now that we've got rid of you, we want you to come back because we need to keep picking on you. We need to keep hurting mm-hmm. you. Um, well, no, I'm going to stay here. Thank you where I'm safe. Well, well now we'll just accuse you of everything from genocide to, mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah. famines and whatever else she's caused. <laughs> she's caused, you know, Megan, that, that poor Megan. I mean, she's caused, don't you know, she caused the last <laughs> hurricane. Uh, the the stock market that fell in 2008, that was all her. You guys don't know about this? COVID, that was her. COVID, oh yeah, she brought it. She brought it from England. And then she also brought all the strains with her in little vials and threw them on all her friends. Like, it's ridiculous that people read this and, 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 and just think that there is nothing more to it. It happened with his mother. I was the biggest fan of his mother when I was young. And I knew, I I loved her, everyone loved her, but they did the same thing to her. This is a repeat playbook. And when you see people taking advantage of someone when they have a voice, that's the difference. If someone is gonna stand up and make some noise, you better be ready to be attacked. And she was, but it was done in a way that it harmed not only her, her mental health, which to me, when I, like the rest of the world that watched that interview, that that to me was the probably the most troubling thing because when you come into a family, you expect support. I don't care what family it is. If somebody comes to you and tells you that they're struggling and then to be turned away, whatever, I'm, I don't know anything in the inside, but I know that's not okay. But the biggest thing that I don't, I, I struggle with um, is when you tell someone that they can't be safe or feel safe and that they're not, they're not um, good enough to be given the rights to feel safe in their own home or with their own children. And the the trafficking issue with that, people cannot, people cannot keep going about their lives blindly thinking that what they're told is the truth. And that comes back to this trafficking. We're not talking about it in a way that is resonating. We are not smacking people in the face I don't know if we need a shock and awe campaign like we did with Iraq that got everyone's attention and everyone on board to go, holy shit, this is happening. This is happening all the way down to 18 month olds. And yet we just sit there and we continue to act like it's not happening because it's not happening to our kids. It's not happening in North America. It's not happening in the UK. I'm sorry, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening to everyone. And I I get a grip of that, that power struggle that power of control and I think what Megan's done with the the British press is she went actually no I'm not accepting that and I'm not allowing you to abuse me my family or anything else um so they turned even harder on her and you know me and Dean as friends we got attacked and we got articles written about us we got you know my you know Twitter trolls everything my daughter's school got got met you know oh, for God's sake. they can they can do and they'll, they'll try and, and and just if we can't harm you we're going to harm everybody around you because you're not playing our game um it's you know whether it's with the 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 Epstein's whether it's the Harvey Weinstein it's, a, it's all that city you can you can go back to the same narrative and end and they think they have they're better and they've got that power and that these girls don't matter. I mean, you heard it. Um, I hate to speak about Prince Andrew, but you heard it in his narrative when he was speaking about the girl. Like, regardless of what the actual true story is, I don't know what the true story is, but 
what can't be denied is she was a victim of trafficking and right. there was zero sympathy or zero empathy towards her in that conversation and um that to me was that that typical kind of um upper class attitude towards these these girls and girls like me girls like you we were not that important and we don't really matter and then when we actually then start speaking up and shouting and I had this conversation with Dean because Dean Dean does love um being light because you know he is a special forces guy and he is mm -hmm. a double world record holder and he's done amazing things and he's done very little you know bad things and when somebody says something about him that isn't true it does it really get them up yeah um, whereas with me because at 17 I had a whole town turn against me I'm like I don't give a shit what you think about me you know like it doesn't really bother me um, because as you say if you're going to start making a change and start speaking up and saying no this isn't acceptable people are going to attack you're going to get attacked and, and things are going to happen um, but I would rather as you say that it was me than somebody who who couldn't handle it that would commit suicide that would do these things and bring it to me I'll deal with it because it's unacceptable you know there's a story that that was out recently in the UK that the British you know there's there's there is organizations in the press that are now fighting against the mainstream press saying it's not it's not acceptable how you you conduct yourself that you know you've got people that are running press organizations that are part of the government you know this, right. this stuff's not acceptable so um you know, there was a girl who'd come forward about a sexual assault from a, a famous a famous name, and the press printed her name in the press. So you know, she was attacked. She was, you know, well, she's done this in the past. She's done this in the past. You know, she wore this. She behaved like this. Whatever it might be, really damaging her her court case and damaging everything else along the way. You know, her mental health, suicide attempts, whatever it might be afterwards, because the press decided that they weren't going to let her do this and the, the the police were involved in it as well and it was it's it's that that whole she's not as important as this guy we need to protect this guy over over her it's same with protect the college student over this girl because he's got a bright future ahead of him or he's going to be a governor or he's going to be the pr the president of the united states doesn't matter it doesn't matter who you are or what you are um, and that's it that's the difference that's where we that's where we mess up I think we mess up and when we it starts off young like you said you're going to talk to your daughter about it you're going to talk to your son about it I I'd like to think in my mind that conversation um frankly coming from from your family to your children there's no way in hell your kids no way in hell your kids are going to be victimizing anybody at any point in their lives and I and I, I think I can say that with like pretty 100 percent certainty because I feel like Dean would Dean would handle it and also you would as well. And that's the difference is it's accountability. And I think it comes down to what we feed uh, our children and our the people around us and what we allow into our families. So the outside influences, like you said, the medias that are attached and have the funding to do this X, Y, and Z, everyone just believes them off the cuff. Well, you must trust them. They're CNN. You have to trust them. They're Fox News. You have to trust them. They're the Globe and Mail. You have to because mm -hmm. they're they're the right people. They're the honorable people. But at the same time, these are the people that are willing to print a victim's name and they know exactly what they're doing doing with it when they print it they're not stupid mm -hmm. yeah exactly and I think again if you it's going to take to me I always say because when you're dealing with something that's three times the size of the marine corps or whatever you, it takes an army to fight that and it can be that every and I, as you say you know I, my dad's a bus driver you know my mum worked three she died when she was 37 but she worked three jobs she taught me you know what it was to be a, a hard worker and but my dad would say, Alana, just be quiet, just sit down, just don't rock the boat because they're going to attack you, you know. And I say, Dad, but if I don't speak up, who does? And he said, But and, I, and he does his little bit. And I say, Dad, but that's fine. You do your little bit. I'll do my bit because right. it's going to take everybody. It's going to take those little tiny little bits that you do by not shopping in that store that hasn't got a, a modern slavery policy or um, or being the person who's you know up there in government fighting it you know it doesn't matter which one you are as long as you're doing that little bit you you'll make that difference if everybody a, if everybody does it and that's what we have to we have to keep that conversation going but it needs to be prevalent and I know for example in 
when I went to my first trade show, okay, um, my very first big fashion trade show where we were welcomed in, which was just bananas. And I, wow, wow, well, that was an interesting experience. I don't come from the fashion world. I don't understand the fashion world. I still don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. But what I do understand is what I do. And what I find really interesting, so the trade show I was at is in Las Vegas, okay? This was in Mandalay Bay in their convention center. In conjunction, it had two other convention centers full of brands in all of those locations with over 7,000 booths in each single one, all different brands, all different manufacturers, all different sourcing. The most fascinating part for me was I got the privilege to be in the conscious collection section. Do you know how big that collection was? Not big, I guess. Okay. I think it was about 30 brands. Out of all of those brands, Rebecca Minkoff, all of these brands, and I'm talking top tier names, Seven Jeans, AG, um, you name it, they're all there. You've got everything from Timberland Boots to Nike to, they're all there. But there's one section and it's one row out of all of that that can be deemed well enough to be in conscious collections, which means you know where it's sourced, how it's sourced, where it's coming from and who's making it. How is it that that industry just overlooks it? It's yeah. because consumers think it's acceptable. Could you imagine if the organizers of that event said you can only come to this event if you've got a slavery statement or you know, however it might it be? Exist. It the fashion industry yeah. would crumble, crumble. Yeah. Or on the reverse, it might be, I remember when I spoke to um, the Scottish rugby mm. and I explained to them about modern slavery and, and about supply chains and about after we had this discussion, they decided they would put into practice that um, any of their contractors, so, you know, whether it's the burger van or whether it's the cleaners or they all had to have a modern slavery statement on their on their website, on their policies and everything else before they would be able to get the contract. So if they applied to, to get the contract, if they didn't have it, they would have to go and get one before they would mm -hmm. they would be able to do this. Um, and they put that policy into place just off the back of a conversation that, that, that we'd had, meaning that now everybody that, that works within the Scottish rugby um, have got that policy. And I said, have everybody done that and just said, well, actually, no, you can't come to this conference or you can't come to this show or you can't do this thing or we're not going to advertise you on our network or if you don't have these policies you'd immediately take away so much power, but you'd lose a lot of money probably in the meantime, which is what they're not willing to do. That's um, it. But I guess, I mean, it's as long as we can keep the movement going and we can just keep more and more people realising, more and more people being aware, you know, not buying, not behaving like that and stopping. The, and even, I mean, I have that uncomfortable conversations with, I remember, I remember a big group of, um military guys and you know I, I did openly just say look have you ever paid for paid for sex and, and you know they all everyone just and you know, I, no. <laughs> and I say, well you know I don't need to know the answer I said, but have you ever paid for a trafficking victim and they all went oh no 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 and I was like well how do you know and they were like well we would know they were you know, like, no you wouldn't what do you think she's got a badge on saying I'm being trafficked no she's she's there to and I said, and if you did know, would you have still gone ahead with, with the act? And, then, and again, they were like, absolutely not. And I would say, well, you're probably, you know, there's probably 20% that probably weren't trafficked. There's the 80% probably were trafficked. Um, and I said, if, if you can find a way to then, you know, cause, and, that, and that's what I think we're doing. We don't, we don't want to vilify people that, that, are, right. that are doing things that we've been doing forever in a day, but... Um, to men, they think that all these women are doing it because they want to do it and they're so happy to be with him and they're, you know, maybe some of them are, but um, there are ways to spot the signs, you know, there are conversations you can have and there are things to speak to, to guys with. And if you do, go, there plenty of, there's plenty of websites that actually teach um, people how to spot the signs and it can be from me and you to the guy who's, who's paying for sex. And I think... You know, most men are not bad men. <laughs> they aren't. And, and I think if we can kind of stop making them all bad for, for, for doing it and actually say, because, yeah, that conversation I had with those guys, most every single one of them was like, no, I wouldn't pay for a traffic victim. Um, but they all put their head down when I asked if they'd, they'd paid for sex. So 
Well, um, these guys, they go on, you know, you, you finish a tour, you go on your HLTA or what, what we call as our holiday break in between tour or wherever, and you go, you go wherever you want. And I know personally, I had a lot of guys that were like, I went to Thailand. Yeah. Why'd you go to Thailand? Because <laughs> I'm not stupid. We know why people go to Thailand. We've had these conversations. Yeah. It's, it's easy. It's, there is a market there. There's a market for a certain type of person there. There's a market because you can get away with it. And it's because they allow it as a tourism option. And that's the difference is if we continue to allow it and we let people think that these people are just are prostitutes and that they want to do it and that they enjoy doing it. And it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of conversations. But what I do know is that the more we talk, the louder you get, eventually people will have to be faced with this. And I know in the United States, there was many cases I've seen them in the news everywhere, left, right, and center. And I, I don't actually watch the news anymore. I haven't for a few years now, but oh, I can't, I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> Oh man, I just end up throwing things at the TV. It gets, it gets bad. It's not cool. I, yeah. So you see these things, like there was a story, a small example, white family. Yeah. I said white, I'll call it out. I'm white. I'll say it. White family who had a woman from another country, a third world country come and it was their nanny and they took her passport when she got there and they paid her almost no money. And they said, well, if she wants her passport, she can't, she can't leave. She's our nanny. She can't yeah. leave. That's you cannot take someone's only form of transportation, pay them pennies and say that you're not doing something wrong there. And it seems to be really common here. I mean, I've moved here and I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it in the UK. Don't get me wrong. I've seen it. I've got friends in, in Dubai. Um, oh, but we treat her really well. We treat her really nice. Oh, well, that's really good. But you don't own her. She's not yours. Yeah. You know, you should be paying her a fair wage. Oh, well, she gets to live with us. So she gets her food and rent. I don't care. Pay her a wage. Pay her money. Give her her passport. She has her freedom. She doesn't have to work 16 hours a day or babysit on demand that you tell her she babysits mm -hmm. just because you're giving her a, a house. You know, you're not the white savior in this situation like saving this person if they're doing a job for you pay them a wage and fair enough it might not be because you're giving them board and room but that needs to be then added up and accounted for and checked and then unfortunately a lot of it is they are undocumented as well so they've got that power over them as well well if you do anything we'll, we'll tell authorities you'll be kicked mm -hmm. back you know um and if you're behaving like that you're you're a bad guy right you might think that you're like doing them a favor letting them stay here but if you're using some of these vulnerabilities for your um profit gain or pleasure then you're you're bad um Period. How, no matter how much you dress it up and try and say that you're doing the right thing and helping them and doing whatever you're not um and i mean i've known rich rich people paying somebody 40 pounds a week on, on wages for being a full-time au pair. No, that's not cool. <laughs> that's not good. I had the privilege of, and I say privilege because I was so lucky to have her. Um, she worked with us, with my son to help us out. And um, she was a nanny. She was an au pair in France first. And um, I met her through a neighbor and she was, um, the neighbor was a nurse. And her, so in the lady that worked with us, her mother was a nurse. So they were friends at the hospital. And she went over to France and she was an au pair for this very wealthy family, like very wealthy family. And it, she was telling me these stories. And I remember talking to her when I hired her, I said, what do you want to be paid? And she told me a number. I said, okay, I'm not going to question it. It's your life. It's, it's your freedom. You you're, she was Canadian. She was from here and, and, you know, she lives in America now and she's, she's a nanny down there, but there's a line where you, pay somebody what they're owed, what they deserve for the work that they're doing. And then there's that, that, that sketchy line where people are like, well, we have other people, you know, we have other people. I have friends and I'm telling you right now, they call up a service. You can go online and you can pick the country you want the nanny to come from. And then the nanny has a conversation with you on the phone and they fill out paperwork and the nanny comes and is a live-in nanny. That's great if it's done right. Yeah. But I can tell you, and I'm sure you can see by my reaction, there's no fucking way all these are done right. 
There's yeah. no, I'm sorry. And then they get passed off so that they can stay. So like one, I remember one situation, I won't name names because I doubt she listens to this, but if she did, she'll know exactly who she is. Who you had a nanny. Oh, she knows who she <laughs> is. Um, this is just one of the people I know. This is the worst part. She knows she had the nanny. Nanny didn't work out. So she called a friend. She's like, hey, my nanny's leaving. Um, do you want her? Slave trade. <laughs> Are you having? You can't just tell someone you're going to live there now. Or maybe you can because the agency that the agency that they hired her from said that's okay as long as she stays in the country a certain amount of time because then she can get her green card. Mm -hmm. Like this is normal behavior. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I had the conversation here with more than one person when we first got here because we've got the two kids and I said, look, it would maybe be good to get a nanny. Well, maybe when we think about it, I don't know what to do. Oh, well, you should get an au pair. You don't have to pay them in. Well, you pay them next to nothing. I said, well, yeah, you do. No, you don't have to pay. No, you do have to pay somebody something. No, no, I'm not saying whatever you do. I'm telling you yeah. that you do have to pay somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and just because they are getting, oh, they get the benefits of, they can have whatever they want in the fridge. You know, like, oh, well done, well done. You know. She can have the ice cream on Thursdays. <laughs> Not Saturdays though, that's my ice cream time. Don't, don't you fuck them. That's the problem. It's, it's the, this mindset, but that's what I'm saying. If people that I know who are doctors, who are lawyers, who live in Canada, who have money to pay, but yet they still go out of the country to hire somebody from India or from Pakistan or from Iraq or for, from Europe for that case, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the Russia for many of these, they automatically assume that these people, this is what they want to do. Well, how, how about we look at that for a second? How about instead of just going, well, this agency looks good and they've got, you know, I know my friend had a nanny from there and it worked out really well. Okay. So maybe we do a little more research. Maybe instead of just finding the easy way out, we sit there and go, okay, well, why why, why is this person that age and has a family over there, has kids, but is coming here? Why is that? It's what's the what's the more likely um, incidence that's happening? That person is being forced. That person is told, well, you need to go there and make money and send the money back. Like, what is the actual reason behind it? And I think that's the difference is we make things so easy yeah. that it's not questioned. No one ever questions it because it's like, oh. Well, that's easy. That's not a difficult process. So maybe I just, maybe I go that process because it's, it's harder to find somebody in Canada and pay them the actual going rate. It's way harder. You actually have to do the work for that. God forbid you had to do the work for something. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen it when um, they started, almost, and as you say about your mom with the, with the little girl, that they, there was a trend for a while of celebrities, you know, going across and saving these babies and bringing them back home. And, and it became, you know, when, when they see that, they'll be like, right, okay, we need to find some babies and we need to find some kids that we can sell because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rich white people are, are buying these, these babies. And, and they think that, oh, well, we're doing them a favor because we're taking them home. No, you're, you're starting an industry. You're starting, um, you know, this is this is now going to become an economy for them, and they'll they'll use that. You know, um, and I think it even happens here that there's kids bought and sold between between families that aren't going through the system properly because the system is not strong enough to to deal with the volume of, of foster kids and and kids that are. You know, I think you know we've seen that foster families get paid money, but what what checks are they done? What what happens with them? That's just this lost lost system of lost souls bless them um but yeah and it's difficult because you do i mean i think me and dean would have a house full of kids if we had if we had a chance but like and it's, it's really it is hard hard work and i think that um but like we've 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 discussed it so many times about the work that we do because sometimes you're sometimes you have days like when you're dealing with a five-year-old being raped or when you're, you're dealing with a story of something or you have to sit in front of you know trafficking people or people that have abused kids and speak to them and get information that you know at the end of the day your head is pounding you don't you know the last thing you'd ever like dean comes near me i'm just like get away from me like i don't want to think about it but and then there's those times where you're like why do you do it but every time that you see these people you just think that nah, you we've got to keep going until until bigger changes it might not be in my lifetime it might be my 
my kids that make the change I don't know but I'm I'm going to keep doing it until until we see major but you are making you are making the change and you're taking the steps and you're 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 doing exactly the opposite of what your dad asked you to do you're being loud about it and the louder you the louder you are the more change that will happen because people don't know what they don't know Mm -hmm. simple. If they're not educated or they've never been taught, they just don't know. And so if people just keep quiet about it, then we allow people like Epstein to continue this behavior. If people don't scream at the top of their lungs until someone takes notice, there will come a time where there'll be a tipping point. I don't know when that will be. My hope is that when things start to become decriminalized, the cartels and the people that are using women and children <clears throat> and young boys and young girls to as a as a financial means i'm hoping that maybe that cuts the supply it just starts to cut the legs and the financial freedom out from underneath these traffickers in a way that it will start to hopefully make a dent when it comes to people like united nations do you know what they're doing in terms of trafficking? Is there initiatives going on or information being flown? Yeah, again, it's it's all it's all individual country based. So every in the, in the problem with a crime such as trafficking, it's borders, it's crossing borders. You you rarely get a girl trafficked from this country that'll be you know used in this country. It'll be moved to another country. So you've then got border issues. You've then got immigration issues. Um, so until they can start putting into place international laws, but mm -hmm. that means that you've got to get international treaties signed, you've got to get people actually agreeing to the different laws throughout the different countries. And when you've got continents that aren't agreeing on it, it's, it's, it's difficult to then get the whole of the world to say, well, actually, this is... And yet it would come from, I mean, United Nations and... Um, they, I mean, they've got policies, they've got gender policies, they've got what they want, they've got the, the um, Women's and Girls' Rights Acts and various different things there, but um, I, I, it's going to take coalitions, I guess, of the US and the UK, but nobody can agree what the, what the policy should be. And there's some fantastic individuals in the world, like um, Andrew Wallace for with Unseen, he runs the Unseen Charity, and he... he virtually wrote the Modern Slavery Act in the UK because the government weren't doing it and he got it into policy and he got it and, and now it is um but it, and basically the Modern Slavery Act says that if you make more than 30 million in revenue you have to have this policy in place it has to be audited it has to be checked but people are using it as a tick box box exercise and they're not being punished if they're not dealing with it so it's like they're 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 meant to do it I think only 40% of the 30 million plus companies are actually doing it and they're not being punished for not doing it. So it's like, well, it's very good putting an act into place, but if nobody's actually, the governments aren't actually following it up because it, it's, it's awful to say, but the people in power in governments are often the people that are using these services and they don't want to end it. Um, so, I, and I guess as well, if we can get more people moving forward through Parliament, you know, more more women in power, um, you know, if we can get the people that are actually concerned about this issue moving up the ladder in power, then that's when things might might start to actually change, because um, there is far too much old men in suits in power without <laughs> doing anything about it in, in, in many countries. Um, oh God, and they're always the most unhealthy looking men too if you're gonna put, yeah. if you're gonna put a man in power can you at least make him look like Jason Statham and put him in a suit I'll pay attention <laughs> to what he's saying any day in a heartbeat I'd be like you're talking whatever you want yeah whatever I'll do whatever you want but <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the but the no but seriously the thing is is what I this is where my brain has a hard time wrapping around it we can all agree on NATO. We can all agree on the Geneva Convention. We can all agree on rules in different countries that it's you go to war, there's just certain things you don't do. Why is it so difficult that those countries who are all part of NATO already, which 
by the way, Saudi Arabia, do we even need to get into that? (laughs) That they even get to have a conversation or a seat at the table is fucking ridiculous. And it's only because the United States, they're their largest export of weapons. So of course they're going to let them do whatever they want, even though they behead over 200 people every single year, but we'll just let that fly. So the thing that I don't get is why is it so difficult to get NATO to sit down at the table and all agree that human trafficking is wrong. We're already a coalition. We're already a like-minded, apparently, like-minded group of countries that agree that you don't use mustard gas, that you don't do this to people, you don't rape and pillage. So why is it diff- so difficult to us to sit down and have someone like you, who is very articulate, very brilliant, somebody who knows her facts and research, who's been in that life itself, sit down and go, this is why this needs to change. And this is how we implement it. I'm not understanding. Mm, I am. Um, well, it's a good point. And, and again, it's something that um, me and Dean have talked about often. Dean said to me, why don't you get into politics? Right? And I'm like, oh my God, it's too corrupt. I would last about five minutes in politics because I give a straight answer to a question. So it's going to be, um, I'd probably be kicked out immediately. But um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess there's that area that there is that little bit of accountability where I say, yeah, well, maybe there, you know, my next, my next stage is my TED talk. And I feel that once the TED talk's done, um, there'll be a next stage from there and there'll be a next stage from there. And that um, maybe one day that is, that is the aim to get something there. But I know that, the, the, you know, when I done that vision board 10 years ago and I said, what mm. do we want? End slavery was there, you know, international policies were there. It was all, it was all there. And I remember the international policy. I was like, how, as you say, it's almost like child's play. It's like talking to an eight year old. Why is it difficult? Why is it difficult to say that trafficking of people, you know, people should not be bought and sold. End of, end of story, like everywhere, like all over. People say there's nuance to it, but I don't believe that there is. They're like, well, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. It's really not that difficult. Where the money comes from, if you're not paying this much for a person, that's trafficking. If you're buying a child, that's trafficking. If you're taking another human being without their rights, that's trafficking. Why does it not just need to be a bullet point fucking form that people (laughs) all sign at the bottom? And if you fuck with any of these, then we fuck with you. Why is it that difficult? I, I think... It's going to take someone like you, though, Alana. I think that you're capable of this, and I really do. And here's why. You are able to take that vision board. You are able to actually put it into play. And you have the mental fortitude, the strength. You have the people around you that can facilitate that. I'm not saying go into politics, but I'm saying I'd vote for you. Awesome. Um, Yeah, and I guess, do you know what else I would say is that, that if we can all understand that what we know not everybody knows and the way I would say that is when I first met Dean um Dean was you know British Special Forces got you've met him you know tattooed bald mm-hmm. muscles he, he hung out with the guys he was a guy's guy very much um a male focused world and when I met him I was single um I as in single as in I'd never really had a relationship I was all about career I was all about the work that I'd done everything else so I wasn't really interested in ever being in a relationship and I just happened to meet him we got together and it was was when I explained to him about um misogyny and and the male world and how we're still fighting he was like no he was like the world's pretty equal and I I think (laughs) no problem no problem I'll let you so I think the first time it ever happened and he came across it, he was like, oh, that was what you were speaking about. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? And then more and more, he was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he mm-hmm. sees it now because it was almost like he needed me to say, actually, it's still happening. And I was on holiday recently with my, my little girl. She's nine. And she'd gone up to get a bagel from the the, the stand. And she, she waited patiently in the queue. And then this guy came behind her. And there was one bagel left. He stepped in front of her and he said to the guy, can I get that bagel? And the guy behind the counter gave him the bagel and then said to my daughter, do you want some bread or something? And Molly kind of came back with her bread and she was like, mum, this just happened. And I said, okay, I'm going to explain to you what happened there. And I explained about this male had that power and he was speaking to this other male. So they had this, this connection. He got the bagel for you. And she was like, wow. And I said, as a woman, I said, you're going to deal with that, but you're going to face it and I'm going to give you tools along along the way to deal with it. 
And since saying that to her, she sees it all the time now. I've kind of opened up Pandora's box because she's now like, Mum, this just happened. Mum, this, I'm, that's not happening. So now she's starting to go, actually, no, this isn't acceptable. And I'm just seeing that and it's not good. And Mum, what can I do about it? So we're in that stage now where we're, we're learning. She's nine years old and she's just had her eyes opened really early. Um, but I kind of thought Dean was like, was that the time? And I was like, yeah, it was the time because she she noticed it and she's seen something wasn't quite right about what just happened. And it was time to explain it to her. And I think if we done that same thing with with injustices, whether it be trafficking, slavery, racism, all these kind of things that go on, if we just had that little bit of eye opening moment where we go, oh, yeah, that's that's not really right. That's not what what should be happening right now, then. It, it, it will start to everybody will start to realize and I think the same with this whole racism issue that people are saying well you know I'm not racist you know I've got black friends or you know I voted for Obama or whatever your reason might be that you're not racist um you'll find that there are little things that you do we all do that yeah that, we, that, that could be improved that we could do better of course and it's not always racism in that sense that it's uh, towards black people or it's towards, you know, the racism has its own has its own nuances and and people overlook them so easily because they're it's baked into how they were raised. It's baked into their family history. They don't they're never had their eyes open. They never had that conversation. But the difference is with your daughter is instead of you just going, oh, honey, it, he didn't see you. He yeah. didn't see you there, sweetie. Like you, you brought it to her attention and it's going to take, it almost feels like we've had this, you and I are in that generation where everything before us was kind of seemed acceptable in, in one way or another. And then we came along and then you've got us having children that are now we're having to have the tough conversations or at least the people that are have the balls to have the tough conversations with their children and say no that's not okay that's no we don't do that we don't we don't act like that my son's four and he, at his preschool he said mommy I like to play with the boys and I said that's fantastic for you why and he goes well because the boys um they play they play rough like he likes to wrestle. He's in jujitsu. He likes to choke kids out. It's a thing. I, yeah. I know. And I said, okay, so why can't you do that with the girls? Well, because I don't want to hurt the girls. And I said, well, would, would you, wouldn't, wouldn't you be more concerned about the girls hurting you? Nah. The girls can't hurt me, mommy. I said, really? So I take him to do jitsu the next day and I put him on his back. I said, Buddy, <laughs> girls can hurt you. You need to understand we're all equal. We don't just get to pick and choose and say, oh, well, girls are weaker than me. Because guess what? Next time you tell me that, mommy's going to tap you out. And I do it to him all the time. We wrestle, he gets in a chokehold, and I make him tap. But there's there's a conversation happening, though. It's a dialogue. It's an openness and a safeness to say, mommy, I don't know why I feel this way, but I do feel this way. Yeah. So, okay, well, let me explain why you might feel that way. And then we go through the things. And maybe this is how we change it. Or maybe we look at it a little differently. It doesn't have to be more than that. You don't mm -hmm. have to go out and say, oh, honey, guess what? There's a good chance at some point in your life, someone's going to try to hurt you. But you don't have to do that. You can have an honest and open conversation based on the age of that child. But you have to have that dialogue and be willing to answer the tough questions. And if you as an adult or a parent don't have the answers, then mm -hmm. you need to go find them for that child because you're only doing the next generation a disservice by allowing them to think that the way things are in the world right now are the way things that need to stay this way. It's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I actually, you made me think about, um, I would try to teach Molly a little bit of tiny little bits of self-defense just, just along the way. She's, she's doing karate just now and we were just doing a little bit of talk about it. And uh, I was saying, you know, to be prepared for things, you know, we were walking through a dark car park at the time and I said, you know, that people could come up as if so if somebody was trying to leg swipe you or something. And I just gave her a little leg swipe. I honestly didn't mean to put her on the floor. I was like, I'm so sorry. I was like, you were meant to be prepared. I've been telling you to be prepared. You just Always be on guard. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dean was like, did you just leg swipe her daughter? I was like, I didn't mean to. She was meant to move. <laughs> she was supposed to move. I thought we talked about this. We had this conversation <laughs> on guard always. It's, it's okay. I, my, we've, uh, we've done it a few times. Like I, my, I remember we were, we were on a walk in the woods with my husband and, and Jack was messing around and he, he had, he was trying to kick my feet out from underneath me. I said, kick my feet one more time and I'm going to kick your legs out from underneath you. They just looks at me. You wouldn't do that. 
So he tries to do it again. He takes two steps ahead. Daddy goes over and just what feet right out from underneath. What was that for? Stop kicking mummy. You don't get to kick people if you feel like you're bigger than them. You don't get to do things like that. Cause I'll hurt you back. Like there's a line here yeah. where there's a there's a limit where you can get a, get away with things in teaching your children. And then some people who are just blatantly soft see that as child abuse. But I learned something recently and I always thought this, but for some reason, when I heard Jordan Peterson say it, I almost like gave myself permission because <laughs> I was like, he's a brilliant psychologist. Okay. He knows what he's talking about in childhood development. And what it was, was do not treat your children any softer than the world will. It's a good one. It's a good one. Because you need to prepare your children. You're only doing your children a disservice if you're not willing to teach them the way of the world. I think, yeah, I mean, we've got, Dean's probably like a little bit over the top with me than, than I am, because I generally do go and see if there's any blood first or I'll check things out. Of course. He, Dean does the um, the first, but, you know, they'll be crying, they'll be on the ground, they'll be giving, they'll be like, what did you learn? What was your lesson from that? What did you do? Uh, and then I'll be like, right, just give, give them a cuddle and then ask them what they learned. So it was actually um, a little while ago, I don't know if you know when Dean broke his elbow. Yeah, I do. <laughs> he was out playing on Molly's skateboard, trying to be cool, went off on the skateboard, fell over, landed on the ground. Molly went over to him. First thing she said, what did you learn, Dad? <laughs> oh, my God, the karma that comes around. <laughs> I just thought it was brilliant. He's literally lying there with a broken elbow, and she's like, so what did you learn from that, Dad? He's like, yeah, lesson, lessons, Dad. That's right. You can't even be mad about that. It's like you got to go, okay, get Molly, give him a cuddle. <laughs> okay, now what did you learn? Now this is how we do it. But that's the truth of the matter is if we're not going to prepare our children for the world they're going to walk into, they're going to be ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. Simple mm -hmm. as that. And it makes them easier targets. And it's yeah. as hard and, and traumatic as that sounds, it's not to scare or, tra or uh, traumatize a child, but it's to let them know that there are things people out there that may not always wish them well or have well intent for them and to prepare them if that ever comes the case to do everything they can to make sure that they don't become that next victim unfortunately we can only do what we can do but what I do know is it's people like you though Alana that are taking the steps to educate and I'm grateful that Dean met you number one we wouldn't have a great you know, a great person as an example in Dean, if you didn't kick him in the ass and say death or divorce, that to me was my favorite takeaway from that entire book. I'm not exaggerating at all. I think it takes a woman with a massive pair of balls to say death or divorce, baby, this is what's happening because I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not a doormat. I don't deserve it. I don't need to. Not that he was doing anything to you to harm you, but it's like you're, you're owed something more. You know, yeah. you, you saw value enough in yourself to know that you deserve something more. And it takes a lot to say that to a grown man that looks the way Dean looks. Just, it does. And he's just a big dude. It's just what it is. Like, yeah, the guy could like, I'm not even going to get into it, but he could break you and like, before you know you're broken. And so it takes a lot for someone to do that. And so for you to be able to then be the person that you are, and I don't even say, you know, I, I don't even want to say his wife. I want to say you're more than that. You're a partner. You're an example for your children, but you're an example for the rest of the world. And you guys are a power couple in the best way possible. You're not a power couple making billions of dollars, riding on your yachts, teaching your kids that they can have Fendi purses at three years old. You're not a Kardashian. You're giving them life skills. You're teaching them properly and you're doing it in order for the greater good. You're helping the world be a better place. And it's going to take so many more people like you. But I think that you've not only sparked something, you're going to continue to educate. I'm so excited to hear your TED Talk. I wish I could be there to just watch you do it because it's, I know how powerful and impactful that it is going to be. And to get that platform to tell that and educate in the way that you're going to, you're going to knock it out of the park. You're going to be the reason this changes. I'm glad. I'm glad you can pick up on the Scottish accent as well. That was the that was the biggest nerve about it. I was like, if I get on that stage and nobody understands me, I'm gonna be. Your accent's not that bad. Cool. It's not that strong. Trust. I the guys I I served with from I can't even say it right. It's like Edinburgh. How do I say it? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Is that right? 
Yeah. So those guys, now those guys, I, I have a hard time even getting on a phone call with, I yeah. cannot understand them. And I served with them and I talked to them on a regular basis. And I'm like, are you going to come on the podcast? They're like, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what you said. So this is going to be troubling for me. Like yeah. if I have Bucky or I have Watson or any of these other guys on, I'm, I'm, I know for a fact it's going to be an issue, but you speak, you're fine. Yeah. Oh, you're I think Dean that. says that about, you know, when they would do calling in the Jets and stuff, and sometimes they'd have the one from Glasgow, and they were like, what? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> like, you don't want that to late at that point, just, you know. Um, but yeah, if you ever met my dad, he would be there. My dad's from Glasgow. He doesn't, you know, I'll, because I've travelled, I adapt my my voice. So if I'm with my friends back home, I probably go a lot more. Um, but dad, my dad never adapts his voice. He speaks in that Glaswegian mm -hmm. accent. Constant, and I've seen him. We were in Thailand once, and he was speaking to this Thai lady, and she's just looking at him like, "What? What did you just say? I've got no idea at, at all." And um, so I can't wait till he gets over here because the Americans are just going to love the oh, pretend, God, they're call you know, so. being super polite. Yeah. <laughs> No, they are. They're going to fall so in love, but it's no different. Like some of the Americans, you go down to Baton Rouge, in Louisiana, you're hum, 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 What did you just say to me? I've, I've traveled all through the United States with my dad and, and, and then for work and then the Americans when I worked with them. And there are just some accents that there is no way, no way you are having a conversation and getting everything they're saying, but you're going to be just, just so, so fine. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And if anything, it's a good accent to have. At least it's one that's understandable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then and pretty much everybody in America is Scottish or Irish anyway. I, mean, so, so. I know. I, I just found out, like my mom got me one of those ridiculous tests and my mom's side is Hungarian. So my, my grandfather came over right after the Soviets invaded um, Hungary after the war. And um, he, his accent was brutally thick. He barely spoke English and, and refused to teach anyone Hungarian. Like just not happening because I'm not doing it. And I, and I lived my life with that. And then I found out, I was like, oh, I'm Hungarian. I'm like super Hungarian. And then I found out, I was like, oh no, you're super Scottish and Irish. You're super Scottish and Irish. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes a lot more sense as to why I look nothing like my mother's side of the family. I only look yeah. like my father, the Burns side of the family. My maiden, uh, yeah, my maiden name is Burns. So uh, like the definition of everyone apparently over there. But the the thing I'm I'm I want my listeners to take away from from this conversation is absolutely nothing I've said in everything that you have, because you have brought so much light to things, um ter like terrifying facts that I do think need a louder voice. And I, I know the TED talk is the platform for you is just going to skyrock your initiatives. And if there's ever anything that we can do to help, I'm more than willing to help you scream from the rooftops. I'll hold the microphone for you and then <laughs> I'll just project it as far as I can because your message and your goals are um, not only admirable, but they are tantamount to those changing the world and can be compared to nothing else but that. And I don't think that you should be compared to anybody else that because nobody else is doing what you're doing and doing it at the level and with the passion and the compassion um, that you are. And I think that's so important, Alana. I really do. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been great. It's been great. It's actually probably the first time I've been on the podcast where the whole conversation hasn't been about what's it like being married to Dean. So it was a nice change. <laughs> Nobody cares. Why would you want, why would I give a shit what it's like being married to Dean? I was in the military. There's a reason I didn't marry anybody from the military. I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Dean. I know that just probably ruined my chances of you coming back on, but that's just the truth, buddy. I know what y'all are like. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, yeah, no, there's no, there's no need. You are a powerhouse and a standalone all on your own. You don't need to, be in anybody's shadow you are the shadow you leave the shadow and you're going to lead the rest of this world to be a better place and I truly believe that can you do me a favor can you tell everybody your social media and anything else where they can reach you or help you with your initiatives and in moving this forward and educating the public on this very important topic yeah sure pretty much just Alana Stott across the board Alana Stott on Instagram Twitter um LinkedIn and my website is just alanastott.com so what's going on with TED Talk? When can we expect to see this out? Um, well, I'm hoping it's um, 
I'm hoping to get on the one in the end of in December, which is TED Women. So um, mm. we are. I'm working with a, a fantastic speaking coach right now, and she's she's putting together the helping me put it together. Which we're 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 nearly there. So I just need to get a bit more um, hand movement going on and a bit more presence. The, the, the words are there. I just need to look look good on the stage doing it. So um, so yeah, the the the, the uh, I'm more of the the covert deems the overt so I'm trying to learn to be a bit more dean for this this one I don't think you need to lean, learn to be a bit more dean at all I think you're just fine just the way you are and if anybody tells you anyone uh, anything else you can feel free to send them my way and I'll smack <laughs> them upside the head and listen you need help with hand gestures I'm like the queen of talking with my hands <laughs> I almost do it to a point and a fault so I can help you out with that but I'm always willing anyway Alana Stott it has been nothing but a pleasure thank you so much for coming on the podcast we can't wait to talk with you soon Thanks. and I'll check you all out later Thank you.